Good evening. We're live. It's 545. I'm Lauren Glendavidian, and I'm pleased to be here this evening with Judy Sutton, who is the new executive director of the Governor's Commission on Women. In fact, it used to be the Governor's Commission on the Status of Women, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But now it's the Governor's Commission on Women. That's correct. And Sarah Lee was a longtime director. That's and correct. you have taken her place. Is that right? That's right. So we were just talking before we went on the air about what Judy's been up to and um, what brought her here to Vermont and to the, the Governor's Council. I keep wanting Governor's Commission to call it the Women's Council. I think it's so ingrained here. But we're very fortunate that we actually have commissions and councils on women, aren't we? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you find your way to the Governor's Commission? Well, I came to Vermont in late 89 and became executive director of a community action agency in southeastern Vermont, southeastern Vermont Community Action. And um, I was the executive director there It's um, for four years. And then I adopted two children from Guatemala, got married, so I was busy with that. And then uh, I did some consulting work, but then just recently I came back into the workforce full time because um, my kids were old enough for me to come back. And what led you to this particular job? What's your <coughs> sort of political background that would bring you as an advocate for women? Um, I've been involved in, in women's issues and generally progressive issues, um, small p. I understand that has a different meaning here in Burlington. Um, for a number of years, I was one of the founding staff people of Haymarket People's Fund, um, which is, uh, provides uh, funds for community activism basically in, in New England and I was also part of the Ms. Foundation for Women in New York City where I, I directed grant making there and on a national basis and looked at women's organizations throughout the country who were working on grassroots issues um, from economic to social issues. So how would you characterize women's position in the state of Vermont? Well, <clears throat> I think there's some issues that are specific to women in Vermont. I think that I, I guess my first response to the question is that women's position is not a heck of a lot different from state to state. I would argue that it is different from country to country. Um, I think that we suffer from, um, uh, still, we still suffer from economic and social injustice as women. Uh, I think it's improving. It's um, economically, it's improving at an exceedingly slow rate. I heard some statistic the other day that at the current rate it would ca uh, will take us from um, 2000 to 20 to equal men's wages, for example. You know, we hear that a lot. And I'll just invite people to call us at 862-3966. What are the key factors that keep women from achieving economic parity with men? I think there are many. Um, there, uh, I guess the, the factors that are probably most complex that are at least talked about um, I mean, the, the simple answers there are, are education, um, but um, the lack of experience because of women dropping out of the workforce to care for family. Women still are the primary providers of sustenance for families, nurturing for families. Um, I think that the, I think more importantly and more deep rooted are the, um, the cultural issues. I think there's deep cultural ambivalence about women in the workforce. Um, I think that was, uh, I think a good example of that was the Louise Woodward case where tremendous amount of media attention was focused on the fact that the woman had left her young child in the care of a nanny for three days so she could, three days a week so she could work. Um, she was blamed, you know, basically women are blamed no matter what they do, whether they go to work, whether they stay at home with their children. I think <clears throat> as a society, whether in, we're in Vermont or whether or not we're in Montana, I think as a, as a culture there's continued deep ambi ambivalence about women and the role of women in the workplace. Can you name a culture where that isn't the case? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, is there a place where women's position is truly appreciated and perhaps even exalted? Um, actually, I would say Iceland. Um, there was a, um, uh, I've done some uh, work in international development also and uh, and I've been to some international conferences on women, and there was actually a women's strike in Iceland where I believe uh, the majority of women stopped working for a week and the economy ground to a halt. Isn't that interesting? Yes. <laughs> and so do you have any other information about what goes on there? No, I, I know there's a woman prime minister. I know that she's very pro-woman. Um, the, but, and I know that it's a small, 
a very homogeneous society. Uh, but other than that, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I do remember the women's strike, and that was in the mid-'80s. And it was very dramatic, because it did grind the economy to a halt. What are some of the goals of the Commission on Women? The, the goals of the Commission are very broad. They're for, um, to support uh, economic and social progress for all Vermont women through a variety of means. Um, I think if you ask uh, Jane Citizen on the street, the um, aspect of her work that we're most known for is the legislative work. We do a tremendous amount of monitoring of legislation during session. I'm not completely familiar with it yet because I'm very new. I uh, haven't been through a session yet, kind of holding my breath till starts. Um, the, uh, we do a lot of not just monitoring of legislation, but also of, um, of initiation of legislation. Uh, drafting legislation and then working it through the legislature. Um, we, and uh, so that's a very, very active period for the commission. In addition to that, we do a lot of, we do publications as our resources uh, allow us to. We're about to come out with a, a fifth edition of Legal Rights for Women in Vermont, um, which should be a, a, a really good, it's a new, um, a really rewritten edition of the, of the booklet. Um, where women can get information about any kind of legal aspect affecting their life. It tells them about both state and federal law that would affect their specific situation. Uh, we do a, a lot of direct service. We have a direct service line where uh, people can call in and uh, I call it a warm line versus a hotline where we can either refer people to w um, who can help them directly or we can often cut through a lot of red tape at the governmental level for, for individuals. What kind of questions do you get on the warm line? We get lot. We get a whole, and I'm not the best person to ask. The staff person named Virginia Renfrew is a uh, person's that line. Um, she. We get a lot of questions about child support. We get a lot of questions about welfare benefits. Um, sometimes we get actually one of the highest um, percentages of. Um, of calls that are around um, a small business development uh, with packets of information for women who are, are budding entrepreneurs. So it's a, a wide variety. I mean, a lot of people call us because they don't know where else to call. I'm just thinking about um, women entrepreneurs. Do you know any of the statistics or information about women who run businesses and own businesses in Vermont? I don't personally. The small business development centers would have those, though. Because I imagine that it's probably a higher percentage than most places, if I remember what I've heard in the past, that a lot of women run businesses and you wouldn't really actually even know that. Right. Because they're micro-businesses. They either just employ themselves or themselves and maybe one, possibly, you know, one other part-time worker. Um, I, small business is obviously the majority of business in Vermont, and I think that would be true for women. Also, I think for women who are juggling uh, family and, and work, as we still continue to do, that uh, working for yourself can be a really viable option. I think that's particularly true in this state. So have you ever run into the question, why isn't there a men's commission? Sure. And what, what, <laughs> how do you respond to that? We call it the U.S. Congress. Six <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And how much money is the uh, the commission run on? Is it federal money or state money? I mean, it's state money. Government money. It's yes, it's state money. We re we, uh, the exciting news is we recently won a federal grant um, to do a. Um, it was the first time the commission had applied for federal money. Um, it was a very. It was a hotly. Com competitive um, situation, it's, and I, it happened before I was there, so I can't claim a bit of credit, but I can get to tell people about it. And uh, we'll, we'll, be running, we'll be running a statewide project to talk with low and moderate income women about um, managed health care, to find out about their experiences on, in health care and managed health care in particular, and then producing a publication around um, around educating them about how to negotiate and deal with their managed health care providers. Let's take this call. Is, um, did we unhook our phone system so people can get through? Okay, good. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi. Can you hear me? Would you like to say something? Okay. 862-3966. We're getting a little tricky there with the camera shots, aren't we? 862-3966. Try again if you can't get through. 
when you were working on the Ms. Foundation, what were some of the more innovative grants or initiatives that you saw benefiting women and their financial position? Well, I saw some extraordinary work. Um, this is in the mid, um, I was working there primarily in the early to mid 80s. Um, I saw, um, for in terms of financial position, I saw women, um, Native American women, uh, for example, spring to mind, who were working both on and off the reservation around economic development issues for the nation, for their nation. Um, that work has, has developed, um, that work has increased considerably since then. I saw, I met with uh, some extraordinary individuals. I met, I met with one of the, the uh, first women who um, began to talk about the issue of incest um, and had, had their first meeting. Of, she, she advertised to, to try to find other women. This was before it was a word we used. Um, she advertised to try to find other women who had had the same experience as she. In their first support group meeting, they all wore paper bags over their heads literally. Um, she was in Colorado. Um, so now it's an issue that's talked about and dealt with to some degree. So it was really, it was extraordinary work in terms of being able to look at the issues on a national basis and support really courageous women who are really out there on the edge. Let's take this call up. Oh, you went away again. 862-3966. You can call us. We'd love to hear from you. You know, the whole question of sexual abuse and incest is, is really a something that is just becoming coming out mm -hmm. and it seems in a way that the 1990s or the, or the decade where so many denied realities about the world that we live in sort of came How out. How about the 80s, the 70s, the 60s? Well there was that <laughs> but I think we started to talk about things in a way that um, you know we were forced to by O.J. Simpson murdering his wife and Michael Jackson being accused of pedophilia. I mean people who were famous mm -hmm. and we sort of held beyond those things were dragged into kind of the, um, not that they were dragged into, but real things that happen to real people happen to people who were big stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, even, you know, the Jean Benet case is one that still hasn't been solved, but mm -hmm. has brought a lot of the work that the woman was doing in Colorado mm -hmm. into the public imagination. And I wonder if you think that that increased awareness is going to have any real impact, any structural impact on the way um, women and um, less powerful people are victimized in our culture? I think it can only do good. Um, uh, Gloria Steinem has a great line that says that we used to not have words for these things. We j used to just call it life. All right, that the, the, uh, the sexual oppression and assault on girls and women has been going on for centuries in this culture and others. I think that the more we talk about it, the more we bring it out into the open, we don't cause it, we simply shed light on its occurrence. And not only on its occurrence, but on the lifelong impact of the, those kinds of, of, those, the, those kinds of events. Um, I, I can only hope that we're, move, that we're moving forward. I think we are moving forward. I think it is a different world today than it was 20 years ago. I mean, I try to think of these issues in terms of my daughter's life. My daughter's two and a half. I would hope that by the time she enters the workforce that there will be wage parity, for example, that she won't be afraid to walk down the street at night without getting attacked. But I think that we have to think about it in a very with a very long-term perspective. Do you think that's tied to the economic order? Definitely. All these things are tied together. People's status in this culture is based on how much they make. So what gives you hope that these things will change? Because they have changed to some degree and because I think that there is a tremendous number of well-meaning people that are willing to do the work to make them change. So let's talk a little bit about the grant that the Commission got, again, um, in terms of public health education. What are some of the barriers that women face in terms of the delivery of health services to them and their general knowledge and understanding of what's happening to them? Well, I, th I think, again, I'm not an expert on this, um, but the, the whole issue of managed care is a really complicated one for people. Um, and the, the state is in the middle of a transition, of, for example, of transitioning people on Medicaid to managed care. Um, I know that when I, um, I, when I went on managed care as an individual about three or four years ago, I made a lot of mistakes in terms of checking in with my primary care provider every, when I needed a prescription. 
and didn't, things didn't get paid for because I made mistakes. A lot of women can't afford to make those kinds of mistakes. Um, when um, we held a press conference about the grant um, last week, and um, I, I gave an example where there was a particular medical service that my, pro that my uh, managed care provider didn't uh, provide, and I didn't agree with it. I thought it was wrong, and so I, I got them to change it. I, ca I called the president of the company. I mean, I just know how to work, the, work things out, and I got them to change the policy. I think, that the, I think that the message for women is that you don't have to um, simply, that you can work with your managed care company, that you don't have to simply um, submit to the, rule, to the rules. I mean, I, I think there's been, uh, I know there's been very careful work done here in Vermont in terms of what managed care companies can and cannot do. I think we benefit by being slightly behind the curve in terms of the nation, in, in terms of uh, the number of people who are on managed care. It's, it's le I believe it's about a, currently about a quarter of all Vermonters. That's changing very, very rapidly. So in some ways, we can learn from the experience of other states as our, as our health care transitions into managed care also. How, how would you grade the state of Vermont on <coughs> the transition of women from welfare into the workplace? I don't have a national perspective on that. Um, I do know, uh, I, I hope to gain that over time. Um, it's an issue that I've worked in in the past and I'm very interested in. Um, the, I know that the current um, welfare reform project of the Department of Health and Human Services is, um, has been described by both people within and outside of the system as definitely kinder, kinder and gentler than the, current, than the federal um, policies, the federal law that came out last year. I'm going to just remind our viewers you can give us a call at 862-3966. We would love to hear from you. So do you have any experience working in the legislature or do you know these folks that are in the, under the gold dome? As under the say? dome, <laughs> yeah. I, I have a little bit. Um, I, when I was director of the Community Action Agency, um, we had a, uh, a lobbyist who actually was Cheryl Rivers, um, who's now Senator Rivers, uh, and, and I, I, know, um, I know Cheryl from those days. Um, she was a very effective advocate. She continues to be. Um, I when Also, in my capacity as a director of community action, I worked uh, quite a bit with uh, Michael Obohosky, who's Speaker Obohosky now. And so I, I do, and then I also lived it before, uh, I moved up here from southern Vermont to take the position. I lived in Putney, and, um, and Senator um, Peter Shumlin, he was a representative then, was my representative. So I know some of the key players who are, who are uh, from the south. Relative from the, the right, relative <laughs> right. Speaking. I have to be careful when I say that because sometimes <laughs> people think I'm talking about North Carolina, <laughs> Southern Vermont. I I should I should just clarify that because it may not be real evident to your viewers that for there is a North South divide in this state, and um, when you talk to people who do live south of say uh, Randolph. And whenever I talk to an audience that includes folks like that, I get lots of nods and nods in the audience because you do feel like you are on the other side. You're in the banana belt when you're in southern Vermont. Uh, the majority of the population is is here in the north. The university is here. The resources are here. The capital is here. Um, so it's uh, it's something I've been very vocal about, and as a result, I'm I'm determined to at least make the activity of the commission quite active in, in southern Vermont also. Well, there is, the, I think that Burlington might even be its own banana belt because the north of here is really not even like Burlington. I mean, you know what they say, Burlington's not in Vermont. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you say that. <laughs> well, I could probably say that. I mean, it's a very different kind of community. Right. And, and I think there are a lot of features in all Vermont communities that make it different, to the state unique from other parts of the country. But, Certainly, Burlington has got the densest population and, and a set of urban issues, and right. it is very capital intensive, but that's where the wealth is agglomerated, and we're not an agricultural society anymore. Right. So what is, you know, what effect does well, that have? Well, you're not an agricultural city, but we are an agricultural well, state still. Vermont is, but it's, it's decreasingly so. So what are the economic options for people in, in general, and women in particular, in 
southern Vermont or the Northeast Kingdom, and what are the options available for them? I think we're still looking at that. I think it's a hard question. Um, I think you're talking about people in particular, people generally. I think that there's not a lot of industry. I think the whole, the whole balance of, of maintaining what makes Vermont a special environment, what draws people here, um, and balancing that with the economic need um, for, for people to have good paying jobs. Um, the, I think the, I, I don't have the answer to that. I think that it would be great if I did. Um, but governor. exactly, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, what kind of steps can the governor's commission take on behalf of women in the economic realm? I, I think that um, one of the, for example, on the federal level, one of the pushes of, or the dialogue around the welfare to, to work issue has, has been um, really getting people to work, period. And I think that if you get, for example, if you get women to work for a $6 wage, um, that's not going to keep them off uh, assistance very long. That you really, I mean, I think we know through the, the livable wage study that you need a solid work, you need a solid wage, of, you know, a minimum of perhaps of $8 an hour. I mean, this is, these are not the jobs people can get if they don't have high school, at least high school educations. And um, I think that we have to look at, at economic development in terms of solid economic development, in terms of really what, what is the, the um, what's an what's a actual livable wage for people in Vermont. We now have that data since that study was done, and I think that we need to look at those issues again from a very long-term perspective rather than sort of this immediate, you know, eliminate, uh, uh, decrease on, of the number of people on the rolls, for example. So what, what are some of the elements of a long-term strategy in your mind? I think, um, I think from the Commission's perspective, the, first of all, livable wage uh, for all Vermonters, women and men. I think also the issue of pay equity is an extremely important one. It affects not just women in their current work, but also in terms of their pension. On the average, women have $420,000 less um, it, over a lifetime in terms of their retirement income than men. That's, that's not a Vermont statistic, it's a national one. Um, I don't know the Vermont one yet, I don't know if we have one. Um, the, so the economic, sort of the economic injustice of women doing the same work the, or comparable work for less pay has a, a very significant impact on women. And, when the AFL-CIO did a national survey, the results of that came out about a month or two months ago. And the, 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 one, the top issue for this survey that included tens of thousands of women across the country, working women, was pay equity. Um, so it's really a major, major issue for the, for the commission and I think for women in the state. We, the, uh, a, a, a woman, a Vermont woman with a college education makes the same as a Vermont man with a high school education. Okay, so there's really no, um, so it, just that, that fact alone, and that's been shown over and over again, means that it's, for, particularly for single mothers, that it's extremely hard to get a wage, to, to, to get a wage that's livable for them and their children. I know this is a really dumb question, but how does that happen? How does it happen that a woman who has a college education gets paid differently than a man with a college education? I mean, at what point does that happen? And what, how does that decision get made? <laughs> it's a, first of all, there's no dumb question, right? <laughs> right. Second of all, I, I think, again, it's cultural and attitudinal. I mean, I think that, um, and, and it also can be how women are socialized to present themselves. Um, I think that when, if you're looking for somebody to be in charge of something, I think it's a cultural attitude that you look for a man rather than a woman. I mean, these attitudes go back for, you know, generations and generations. Um, I don't think it's simple. I don't think a lot of, I don't think a lot of it is conscious. Uh, the, so for, that's why we keep talking about it, to make it conscious. Um, the, uh, there's, and, and also there's a lot of backlash. I mean, for all the advancement women have made, and they have made some, you, also, you always have to be dealing with people who are talking about the Commission on Men, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it happens, at, it, it happens at the entry into the job market, 
It happens later on when promotions are be being decided on. It happens when you're deciding on who you're going to make the supervisor of the line. You know, I think that, that, um, that gender bias enters into all those decision-making points throughout a woman's workforce. And also, because of the market, women will work less than men. And so in terms of just what, what the market will bear, you can hire a woman less expensively than you can hire a man. So there's sort of a bottom-line economic issue. Our number is 862-3966. If you have any questions or comments, we're speaking with Judith Sutphin, who is the new executive director of the Governor's Commission on Women. That's 862-3966. Um, I'm wondering if these numbers start to change in terms of women's wages and pay equity as women become bosses and run companies. I mean, are there statistics that show that women that run companies, women run companies tend to have different pay equity questions, or do you think the same thing is replicated? I, I think that's a good question for Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. I hope the answer is that it's different. I don't know, though, for sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, it would be, it, because I think that when you're, when you're a woman running business, the chances are you're more aware of the fact that you have more men than, you know, the composition of who is working for you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you tend to, I mean, I know that we do, we're just always aware that, mm -hmm. well, gee, we got a lot of guys working for us, time to get some women in here. Mm -hmm. How can we promote women? Or really thinking about developing those networks of advancement, which really are the basis of people moving ahead in a workplace, is who you know. Right. much more than what you know, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. very clearly true. And so if you haven't cultivated those networks and those relationships, then it's harder to move onward. Right, exactly. And that's, that's an, another element, I think, that holds women back. I mean, for example, when I took the job as executive director of the Community Action Agency, it wasn't a business, it was a nonprofit, but I had a, a budget of about 1.2 million and 43 staff people. There were people who were working for the agency that were eligible for our services. They were so low income. I raised everybody's wage from people who were making six to six dollars an hour entry level. I raised everybody's raise. I, I raised everybody's wage to eight dollars an hour. That became the bottom. And it was expensive for the agency, but and they've maintained that wage rate because I think I didn't want to pay people a wage that wasn't livable. And how did you, as a, as from a business standpoint, how were you able to justify that? It wasn't a business. We weren't there to make a profit. Um, a lot of it is, is, and I can't talk from a business perspective because I have not worked in business. I've always been a, a, a non, an advocate, a nonprofit manager. Uh, but actually, a lot of the, not, the, a lot of the decisions around management of a nonprofit are as difficult or more difficult than a profit, um, than a profit-driven operation. I, I felt like I couldn't justify paying people so little that um, they were eligible for services for the poor. That was a contradiction in terms. If our mission was to move people out of poverty, we couldn't people keep people in poverty by paying them such a low wage that they were still in poverty even though they were employed. Well, I was talking to a guy today who I was walking down the street talking to him and he was telling me about how he, he cleans out the something at McNeil, the McNeil plant, which is our big power plant, all the wood chip bins that come in, and he gets paid six twenty-five an hour, and I thought, that's $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. That's $12,000 a year. Right. Right. And this person works really hard all day long, mm -hmm. really hard, physically difficult work, mm -hmm. and they make $12,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, God forbid he has a family that he has to raise. Right. So it isn't that hard to imagine how people fall from being able to afford to survive to being on public assistance. Yeah. Well, we've got to wrap up here. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you. And I wish you great luck in your work at the Governor's Commission on Women. I encourage you to come anytime on the Channel 17 and tell everyone what you're up to. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks. for watching. We'll see you later.